I want you to cast your mind back. If we were in some 90s drama, the screen would be going wibbly wobbly right now because I am going to take you back to 2007. Beyonce is topping the charts with Irreplaceable. Eurovision is being opened in Finland by Lordi after their awesome win the year before with Hard Rock Hallelujah, and the innocent little video sharing site YouTube has just been bought by the ever-growing and definitely not evil search company Google. And onto the stage for the Macworld keynote address wanders the shy, retiring gent that was Steve Jobs. Trademark black turtleneck in place, he introduced a device that would come to change the world. The iPhone. And to be clear, the smartphone wasn't invented at Apple in 2007. IBM usually gets the credit for that with the Simon Personal Communicator back in 1994. But back in the 90s, really neither the infrastructure was there, nor was the technology. So while the Simon was an awesome piece of tech for its time, it was pretty restricted. It wasn't until 2007 when Steve Jobs walked on stage and demonstrated what would become an icon of the modern world the iPhone, that things started to look up for smartphone technology. But while it was pretty obvious that it would make its mark, it was quite a while before the iPhone and its Android brethren would find their way into the hands of the masses. In its first year, the iPhone sold 122 million units worldwide. That's a lot of phones to be sure, but it's not enough that everybody's going to see someone with one every day. Hell, if you look at the graph of smartphone adoption for the first three years, it looks like a nice dental slope. Technology just creeping into people's lives. And then a few years later, the number of phones doubles. And then the number of phones sold doubles again. Suddenly, almost everyone you know has a smartphone and they're being given away free with boxes of cereal. And we've seen this time and time again with technology. Back in the very early 80s, when my dad brought home an old Commodore pet from work to trial as a replacement for his home-built terminal, we were real outliers. Virtually no one had a home computer, and even fewer had it hooked up so that they could talk to the outside world. Now, most people, at least in the West, have some form of computer at home, whether it's a modern take on the once ubiquitous beige desktop, a shiny iMac, a generic laptop or a tablet of some sort, it's almost inconceivable for most of us to imagine our lives without these devices. But it took nearly 20 years for the personal computer to get to 15% of households owning one. And then things got interesting again. Suddenly we leapt from 15% to more than 30 in less than a decade, then more than 60 in just a few more years. And one of my favourite graphs that shows how bad we are at considering this pattern when it comes to technology adoption is solar panel adoption. Every year the International Energy Agency publishes its World Energy Outlook and every year they take a ruler and plot a near flat line that totally fails to even get close to current trends. But the tricky thing with the S-shaped adoption curve for technology, which we sometimes refer to as the hockey stick because the part we like to look at is hockey stick shaped, is that we don't know how long the blade of that hockey stick is. It's something we've seen time and time again, from electricity to the television, from the microwave to the personal computer. Technology adoption starts with a very slow climb in ownership initially. Then suddenly everyone you know has it, unless it's a CD video disc. In which case, very few people have it, then no one does. Which is the other part of this pattern of technological adoption? The perilous crossover from those early adopters to the mainstream, nicknamed the chasm. Sometimes technology adoption looks like you're going to make that leap from early adoption to conventional, only to suddenly disappear without a trace. Elkaset, anyone? Some of that is down to how ready for prime time the technology is. While I might quietly fawn over a Sophie Wilson designed Acorn System 1, how useful home computers were in 1979 when it came out is pretty debatable, to be generous. Which is to say, when they were new, you needed a pretty explicit reason to get one. But at this point in history, the internet is basically like a utility. Like power and water. It's actually pretty difficult to deal with the modern world without the ability to send and receive email and have access to various websites. Really, having a computer of some sort is pretty much vital. The question is, will, or more likely when, 
will we see that kind of uptake with EVs? Well, in sheer numbers in the US, we've transitioned from the innovators period of ownership. While we might often refer to those first in line to buy new technology as early adopters, in technology adoption lifecycle terms, the ones getting in line for bleeding edge technology like those first roads to Leaf and IMEAV buyers, they are termed innovators. Usually, innovators have more disposable income and are less risk averse than the general population, but at least on the west coast of the US, we're now into the next zone, the early adopters. With the International Council on Clean Transportation stating that around 7% of folks on the west coast have an EV, in modelling terms, we're well into the phase before that big jump. Typically, that happens at around 10-15% to of ownership. Historically, this group of buyers, termed early adopters, are younger, have more formal education and are less financially well off than innovators, but still have significant amounts of disposable income. That description definitely ties in to what the statistics are currently saying about EV ownership. So what will it take to tip us into mass ownership and at the same time avoid tipping into a chasm of irrelevance? Well, part of it is, as I hinted earlier, the maturity of the technology. While most people drive fewer than 50 miles in a day, it's clear that convincing people that a vehicle with 80 miles of range is sufficient is not so much an uphill battle, as it's like asking Dave to open the pod bay doors. So for the last few years, we've been trying to persuade people they want something that they instinctively feel won't meet their needs. And it turns out that's a pretty hard impression to overcome, even if it's wrong. Thankfully, as battery capacity has increased, we've moved from cars with 50 to 80 mile ranges to cars with 200 to 300 mile ranges. And we've moved from cars that rapid charged at just over a mile a minute to cars that can charge at more than 10 miles a minute. All of these changes make the EV much more palatable to those who maybe previously wouldn't have considered one. Add to that the slow but steady increase in people realizing that the EV is not the same as a golf cart, and I'm gonna put Tesla in the top of the pile in changing that attitude. Oh, and the other factor leaning on the scales of adoption is anthropogenic climate change. As the natural world has made it increasingly clear that we've, well, balked it, with once in a century storms each year and once in a lifetime weather events a few times each season, People are starting to gather that the scientists dryly commenting on extreme weather events, sea level rise, desertification, temperature rise, they, they meant within our lifetimes, not at some nebulous point in the future. And that focuses the mind a little on resolving this problem. There are clearly many in the fossil fuel industry who would dearly love the EV to follow the dishwasher with its 58 years to mass adoption, but we can't wait that long. At the moment, the odds look good for mass adoption. Despite falling sales for fossil fuel vehicles, in many places demand has increased for plug-in ones. Reductions in manufacturing costs are also encouraging manufacturers to shift more of their production towards EVs. Even automakers that have been recalcitrant to produce electric vehicles like Toyota are starting to be dragged kicking and screaming in the direction of EVs. It's definitely looking like we've jumped the chasm, which should mean things only get more interesting from here. That's it for today. Please do hit subscribe and the bell if you haven't as it stops YouTube from doing weird things with our content. And make sure you're subscribed to Take Two and Transport Evolved Shorts. There are links below. And check that bell again. Sometimes it gets turned off. Thanks on behalf of the entire TE crew go out to the folks on my right for being our $15 to $49 a month patrons. Special thanks to our $50 a month patrons, Andrew Martin, Guido Drahoa, Brophy Wolf, Anonymous Freak, Regine Fellows, Kyle Hodgson, Gordon C, Paul Conway, Laura Sanborn, Anthony Coates, Denny Hyde, Sean Ueda, and Tezza in the Gong. And our deepest gratitude to our $100 a month Patreon supporters, John Lyons, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, JP Fagerback, Will Graylan, and Ian. If you'd like to join the ranks of wonderful supporters, you'll find links below to Patreon, Bitcoin, and Kofi. Chat with the team and TE fans over at Discord, and if you'd like to buy some TE swag, just head on over to our Redbubble store. Our new pride designs, like this one, are now in stock, and proceeds from this month go to the Trevor Project. Thanks for joining me, and as always, keep evolving!